ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣುರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ದ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ನೈನ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ವಿ ಹಾವ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿಗನ್ ದ ನೈನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ದ ರಾಯಲ್ ಸೀಕ್ರೆಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ರಾಯಲ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ what is this royal secret and royal knowledge at almost at the very beginning of the chapter there are these two remarkable verses which we did uh, last time i'll just touch upon them a little bit and then go on fourth verse and fifth verse two of the most stunning uh, verses in the bhagavad gita where um sri krishna makes uh, you know he reveals himself or reveals god what is god where is god and he does it in three propositions he does it once denies that does it a second time denies that too and does it a third time it's very remarkable this these two verses maya tatam idam sarvam jagad abhyakta murti na where am i i pervade this entire world in all the living and non living beings i am i am in all of them in everywhere i am in in everything in this world then next matsthani sarvabhutani na cha aham teshu avasthita so not that I, i am in all living beings and all living and non living beings not that i am in all these beings not that these beings are and i am then in them no rather it's the other way around i exist and in me these beings exist how so in what way it's like um, um you know not like a cup or a bowl containing um, Uh, cookies or something not like that not that god is like a bowl and in which all beings are kept rather the uh, wave it's not that there is a wave and there's water in the wave rather there is water and the wave is in water similarly there is god there is a reality spiritual reality in that all beings are there just like waves in the water and we might say the clay pot has clay in it but actually is there a pot which has clay in it no there is clay which has been given the shape and the name and the uh, function of a pot that's what we call a pot and that's a fairer more accurate description of a pot it's like if the clay were to say i pervade all these pots in all these pottery i am whatever pottery you see the clay pottery i am but then the clay will correct itself and say that no no it's not quite that a better way of understanding is that i am i exist i am the material i am the substance i am the stuff and the pots are various shapes and names you know pot jar pitcher whatever they are given to these various shapes and they are put to various kinds of use so i am i the clay am in me are all these pots i the water am in me are all these waves and bubbles and foam and surf and uh, i brahman i am in me are all all of these things which you call existing things of the world living beings and non living beings and then he goes on to deny that also <laughs> uh, third line the, the first line of the fifth verse nacha matsthani bhutani pashya me yogam aishwaram so i am in me all of these beings are and then the most profound step these beings are not there in me i alone exist there are no such things as different beings in me a different sentient beings jeevas non living things a physical universe no god and god thick without any space or uh, any kind of um Uh, uh, gap uh, or possibility of anything non god existing uh, in between god no god and god alone and then he says after pulling up this grand trick in three steps he says so did you see my magic pashya me yogam aishwaram he starts with the world and then introduces god 
God, whatever you see, wherever you see uh, all these beings, living and non-living, I am in them. Step one. And then in step two, he says, no, look closely. I am and all these beings are in me. Like pots in clay or uh, the, the, the cloth in threads. You might say threads are in the cloth. And if you look closely, no, no, it's not that there's a cloth and then threads have been put into it. The threads have been arranged and that's what you call a cloth. They have been woven and that's what you call a, call a cloth. So the cloth is in, in the threads. This is a strange way of speaking, but actually that's true. And all the waves are in water. Exactly like that I am and everything else is in me. And then finally, the hammer blow. And everything else is not in me. I alone am. God alone is. Brahman alone is. Pure being, pure awareness alone is. This is, look at this magic. This is called Maya. I Two quick points here. The first one is, I was reading um, uh, Gyaneshwari. It was composed originally in Marathi. Um, I think old Marathi. So but there are nice translations available. So I was reading uh, M. R. Yardi's translation. What did Gyaneshwar say about these three verses? And he says something so beautiful and yet profound. The third one, I am in all beings, step one, step two, no, no, all beings are, are in me, I am not in beings. And step three, all beings are not in me. Brahman alone exists. That one, what does Ganeshwar say? This is a very beautiful translation of the Ganeshwari into English. There are multiple translations available nowadays. So here goes. The third step, what does the you know, commentary say? If you wish to see without misconception my real nature beyond Prakriti, you will realize that the statement that all beings are in me is false. <laughs> because, why is it false? Are beings not in you? They are. But a deeper realization would be, he says, because I am all this. Because in the twilight, the twilight of uh, ignorance, you know, the mind's eye becomes dim. And in that dim light, although I am one, I appear to be many beings. When the dim light of the divine, um, the divine you know, display, Maya, comes to an end, I appear in my true nature as the garland, which appears like the serpent, is seen in its true form. And so on. So there's more into this, but it's so um, beautiful. He says, just as a giddy person thinks that the surrounding objects are revolving around him, you know, whirling around, and seems the world is whirling around me. So the beings appear as superimpositions on one indivisible nature. When this misconception ceases, no one can imagine even in a dream that I exist in the beings or that beings exist in me. So these are profound spiritual realizations. And he says, absolutely, these are all erased. To say that I support the beings or I exist in the beings is like the raving of a person suffering from uh, delirious fever. Thus it is that the misconception of an unreal being that makes one think that I am the core of this universe or the support of the beings. Just as one sees the non-existent mirage due to the sun's rays, he thinks that I exist in the beings and the beings exist in me. So, and he goes on. Very powerful statement. Now, I'm going to put a little caution here. The caution is this.
that when we hear this, three steps, three revelations, then we say, oh, so the real thing is that Brahman alone exists and that's what we should catch hold of. No. All of these are very, each of these three steps is a very, very valuable spiritual um, realization and stages of spiritual growth. If we have even the first one, it's very fulfilling. The second one, very fulfilling. And of course, the third one is the ultimate. Just the first one itself, that the feeling, the sense that in all these people around me, in all beings and even in non-living beings, the beloved Lord dwells, the glorious Lord dwells right here. These human beings walking around me, they are like walking temples of God, of the divine. So close is the presence of the divine. So close to us. Right? We are surrounded. We are immersed in an ocean of God. So the first step is not that immersed in the ocean of God. First step is to feel the presence of God in those I interact with. It's very elevating. It immediately raises us above our petty concerns, little problems, even life and death are not big issues anymore. We are ever in the presence of God. Swami Ashokananda says, what is the greatness of feeling the presence of God in uh, human beings, in all people around you? He says, when people are searching for God, meditating, praying, uh, they keep saying, my mind wanders around. I'm searching for God. Where is God? My mind is... So I, I cannot steady my mind in meditation. Uh, where is God? Ashokanji says, foolish question. Where is God not? In so many ways, God is uh, revealing himself, herself, itself. Kali Puja is coming, so herself. She, the Divine Mother is revealing herself all around us. So the first stage is great. Uh, how inspired we feel in the holiest of temples of our own tradition when we go you know, on pilgrimage. These are you know, experiences we will never forget in our lives. Blessed experiences. But the same experience you can have all the time without break if you feel the existence of God in everybody. Even to just to believe that in all these people I, I, am, I am dealing with, visibly, God is there in all of them. It's God shining through all of them. It just revolutionizes your, your thinking, your day. Your day becomes changed. So this is, however, this is still dualistic. There's a distinction between God who is indwelling and the uh, sentient being, living being. Uh, you know, uh, Holy Mother, Ma Sharada, she says even non-living beings, non-living entities. So there is an incident in the village house. Somebody is sweeping the courtyard and after sweeping the broom, this lady, she throws the broom. Uh, it was a, either a lady or a monk who threw the broom uh, aside to a corner. And the mother said, Ma Sharda said, what is that you're doing, my child? Uh, even, don't, don't disrespect it so. Even, even these things have their own dignity. And she carefully kept the broom aside. Why? First of all, it's a very good practice for us to be sensitive, to be careful. Um, it's a sattvic mind. A sattvic mind will not behave in that way. It's only a restless mind, you know. I sweep, swept it and threw it aside. Uh, a sattvic mind will be, will do the work carefully and keep the implements of work, the surroundings, everything clean and there will be a grace to work. That's first. But there's a deeper meaning to it. It's because the divinity dwells everywhere. In every, in every um, grain of dust that has mote of dust that has been swept aside by that broom, there is the divinity. And in that broomstick, uh -huh. and in the person who is sweeping, everywhere. Even the small act of sweeping, uh, there is a beautiful story about Swami Brahmananda. In his, uh, he went on a tour to the south of India. Um, he was taken by the Swami there to the, I think, the Meenakshi temple. And so when Swami Brahmananda entered this temple of the Divine Mother, a very ancient and very powerful temple, 
very powerful deity present there. When um, Swami Brahmananda entered the just the precincts of the temple, not even the um, the inner sanctum, not the Garbhagriha, but outside, he he saw somebody sweeping the courtyard, and he uh, he was already in a semi ecstatic state. He took the broom and started sweeping, and that was so graceful to see, so elevating to see this this monk, this holy man sweeping uh, the courtyard of the Div Divine Mother, people stood and watched. And those other devotees and monks had gone in entourage. He's the president of the whole Ramakrishna order at that time, the spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna. He's sweeping the uh, temple courtyard. It was, it, was, it sent people into a, a high spiritual state just to stand and watch that. And then, then he went on into the temple. Somebody took him inside. He was already in an uh, ecstatic state, in a, in a samadhi. Then the interesting thing was another monk who had been very inspired by this. So he picked up the broom and started sweeping, doing the same thing. And the people said, remarked, somehow it suddenly seemed artificial. So, so that, that is what Swami Brahmananda is. He's seeing the presence of the divine everywhere in everything. Still duality between the indwelling of the divine and where the divine dwells in. You go higher. This is into the next step where it is one divine reality. In Sri Ramakrishna's words, Shab Judi act, everything taken together, it is one reality. All living beings, men and women and children, old and young, uh, all animals, plants, insects, all non living things, all articles, the sky and the earth and the water, all one all together, one organic unity. And this is the insight that on which Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta is based. Uh, so when the second step, Krishna says, I do not dwell in them. They are all in me. You should see Ramanuja's commentary. He, he is like, aha, this is what I was talking about. And he gives a beautiful commentary there. Uh, that uh, He uses the classic terminology of, of Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, whole and the part, the body and its parts, Shesha Sheshi. He says, uh, all beings are parts of the divine. And the whole, the, the composite whole, the divine, Sheshi. So this is the second step. When the third step comes, that, that all beings are in one organic whole, that's denied. There is only Brahman. Only, you know, like Aurobindo says, the white glare of, uh, of an immense uh, radiance, white glare of an immortal gaze, he says, of an immense radiance. Nothing else. That is non-dual, nirguna brahman. No, no second reality is there at all. No world to talk about, no difference at all. There I was noting uh, Sri Ramanuja's uh, commentary, he falters there. He can't go there because he stops with the oneness. You know, everything is one organic whole. Everything is there, but we are all part of a greater whole. And that, that whole is the divine. But he has to stop there. When the next step that is denied, there are no parts. There is only that inconceivable existence awareness. He gives, um, he immediately backs up there and he says, no, no, no. What that means is, God's sankalpa, that is the divine will. Um, every, everything depends on that divine will. Divine will does not depend on anything else. So God's uh, will is independent. So, uh, so he will not trespass beyond that. Shankara, of course, is delighted there. Uh -huh. Everything is an appearance. Brahman alone is the unfettered reality there. And that thou art, you are that reality. Anyway. So that is Advaita. Here itself in these three stages, you have a kind of dualism. But it's a pretty advanced kind of dualism, the first stage. Then Vishishta, the qualified monism, second stage. And the non-duality of Shankara, of Advaita Vedanta, the third stage. Okay. Then um, Sri Krishna gives an example. The sixth verse. Yathakasha sthito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan 
तथा सर्वाणि भूतानि As the vast wind blowing everywhere ever abides in space, no, even so do all beings abide in me. Now, here he gives the example of space. It's a favorite example for non dualists, for Advaitins also. And if you see in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, space is a, is a good example used again and again. So just as space, what is like space? Brahman, ultimate reality is like space. And what's this universe? All beings and everything, they are like the atmosphere, which is, you know, vast atmosphere ex extending from our sea level up to the stratosphere, troposphere, whatnot, uh, becoming rarer and thinner and thinner till it disappears off into uh, near Earth space. So, that vast atmosphere dwells in space. Um, and now you might say, but isn't this dualistic? There is space and there is the atmosphere. But the only thing that is what uh, Krishna wants to show here is that not that there is a uh, you, you know, Brahman and there is a world like the space and the atmosphere. Rather, just as um, the space is not touched not affected by the atmosphere, by the, uh, what it, it contains. Space is completely unaffected. Similarly, Brahman is not affected by the beings in Brahman because they are appearances. Notice, if it's a pot and you keep something in the pot, it will affect the pot. If you keep dirty water in the pot, uh, it will uh, cling to the pot. The pot will become dirty, even if you pour the water out. If you put uh, fragrance and incense in the pot, the pot will absorb some of the fragrance of the, of the incense. So, container and contain, they come into contact. But only when do they not come into contact? When they are not at the same level of reality. So, for example, a movie, the movie screen and the, the events in the movie. So, suppose there's a catacly cataclysm in the movie. Uh, there's a huge explosion uh, does the screen burn up? No. There's a huge, great flood. Is, does the screen get wet even a little? No. So the events in the movie, which are experienced, you see them, you react to them emotionally, and yet they do not uh, affect in the least the screen on which they are appearing. Because they are appearances. The screen and the fire or the flood are not on the same level of reality. The screen is, you know, what, what is called in Advaita, the transactional level of reality. Our empirical reality is a screen. And the flood or the fire is at a fictional level of reality, what is called pratibhasik, an appearance, illusory, fictional level of reality. What is in fiction does not affect what is in our transactional empirical reality. So what's your point? So what is in our transactional empirical reality equally will not affect the absolute reality um, Brahman. So the imperfections of the world, uh, the sorrows of the world, the disasters of the world, um, they, they do not leave a mark on the absolute reality. You say, that's great for the absolute reality. What about me? I have absolutely no use for such a philosophy. It doesn't do me any good. Well, which, where are you? Are you on the transactional level or the illusory level or the absolute? Uh, we are experiencing ourselves on the transactional level and Advaita Vedanta tells that you are none other than the absolute reality. The absolute reality is the only reality. What appears at this transactional level is an appearance. What about me? Brahman can do whatever it likes. The world can be false or real. I don't care. But I am really interested in I, me, myself. What about me? You are Brahman. Don't worry. You are that absolute reality. So this is the basic um, teaching which Krishna is trying to convey in these three verses and which Advaita Vedanta is trying to uh, convey. We see ourselves as this Vyavaharika, transactional level of reality and Advaita is trying to push us into an understanding that we are the absolute level of reality. This is what the whole, is what's going on here. And the space example is meant to show just that much. The absolute level of reality Nirguna Brahman is not at all affected by the appearances of the world, with the world appearance. 
Uh, and notice, vayu. So there's um, air is an existing substance, and it has certain qualities. Um, and then sarvatra go. It 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 spreads everywhere. It moves. There are gusts of wind and storms and typhoons and hurricanes. So all of this is going on in the atmosphere. Similarly, um, in pure consciousness, in pure being, there are existence which appear. They, they appear. The pure being or Brahman does not become existing things. But existing things appear like movie images, like um, dream experiences. And there is activity there. So existing things appear. This is, I'm translating from the in, you know, Nyaya terms of Dravya. They have certain qualities, good or bad. And they have action. Something is happening there. Karma, Dravya, Guna, Karma. Substance, um, quality and uh, action. All of that is in the appearance. And none of that uh, affects the underlying reality. And you are that underlying reality, except that you manifest through a substance. What is the substance? The body. And you have certain uh, qualities, certain characteristics, male, female, uh, race, you know, gender, age. And then activities are going on. Karma is going on. But they're all at, just like the air, all its qualities, its substantiality, and its activities, none of them affect the underlying space, the and the space makes it all possible. Space has this nature of capaciousness, of spaciousness. So it, it provides the stage, let us say, for the, the drama of the entire universe to unfold. You are like that. The unlimited, limitless Brahman, um, pure being, pure awareness, in your limitless sky, the, the drama of life, your life and everybody else's life, it plays out. And it just like the sky is untouched by the atmosphere, you, the limitless sky of awareness, you are untouched. From the beginning of this life till the end of this life, you're, you're exactly the same. Um, the space idea is used at three levels in uh, Vedanta. Mahakasha, Chittakasha, Chidakasha. Akasha, if you translate it as space or sky. The physical sky, the space, the physical space we are surrounded by, in which the universe hangs. You know, the universe is set in the physical space. Time, space, matter, energy, they're all encompassed in Akasha, the Mahakasha. Mahakasha means the vast sky or the vast space. But there is another sky, there is another space. It's called Chitta Akasha, mind space. Now it is some app, I think. Uh, some kind of app is there, mind space or head space, something like that. So mind space. Mind is, is it's a separate space. It's not like this physical space at all. Um, what, why would you say that? Isn't the mind in this physical space? No, it is not. See, uh, the body is in physical space. The head is in the physical space. The brain is in the physical space. And you say, there you have it then, Swami. Mind is in physical space. But brain and mind are not the same thing. In this physical space, you can locate the brain. You can locate neurons. You can locate neuronal activity. Can you locate a thought? So that neuronal activity, that's the thought? No. Say, so I have um, a thought that it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. That's a thought. Look at that thought. You can maybe correspondingly find out some bursts of tiny bursts of electricity, neuronal activity, with the fMRI scans. Well, all you have located are little bursts of uh, electrical activity in the brain. That's all you have located. Where is the thought there? So, oh, what I mean is it's producing that thought. How? Then you run up against the hard problem of consciousness and so on and so forth. And it's not just today, David Chalmers and Hard Problem of Consciousness. Uh, one Tibetan Lama I was reading, he puts it so briefly, you know, a huge amount of philosophical discussion. And he puts it just briefly. He says, if you say that um, consciousness is being produced by matter, by brain, you run up against two massive philosophical challenges, which have not been overcome. 
What are those challenges? First of all, you have to admit that matter, energy, time, space, brain, body, they exist independently of your mind. This is Tibetan Buddhist saying this. Independently of your mind, you have to admit that. So yeah, we do. You do because you're not trained in philosophy. If you were trained in philosophy, both Eastern and Western, you would know that this is the called the idealist problem. How do you... See, you can never experience a world outside your, uh, you know, your mind. You can't. You say, but Swami, aren't you experiencing a world outside the mind just now? Are you? Gaurapada would say, switch up the mind, experience the world. You can't. The moment the mind is switched up, you go like deep sleep, fall asleep. No world is experienced. The world is experienced only when the mind is active. Now, one might say, look, that's not such a big deal. The world exists and you need a mind to experience the world. That's why the world is experienced when the mind is active. Yes, but how do you know the world ex exists uh, when the mind is not active? How do you know there is a world that exists outside the mind if you can at no point experience anything without the mind? So that was the whole basis of uh, idealist philosophies like the Buddhist Vijnanavada. This is not Advaita, by the way. But the Buddhist Vijnanavada, Yogachara Vijnanavada, which is one of the fun, uh, primary streams of uh, Buddhist philosophy, Mahayana Buddhist philosophy. So the Lama says this is one problem we will have to face. If you say body and brain have produced mind, how do you know there is a body and brain which precedes the mind, which is like outside the mind? That's one. Second, he says that. If you hold that the body and the brain have produced the mind, then you have to answer the hard problem of consciousness. He didn't use those words. He says, how will, suppose body, uh, you say that brain has produced, there's a brain and it has produced a mind. How? How can a material thing produce a non-material? We've just said that mind cannot be located in space. So that non-material mind, how is it produced by a brain? And the problem has become even more poignant now with these artificial brains, you know, AI and all this, none of them have minds. None of them have uh, any first person experience at all. They can do everything that our uh, mind does. They can do it, but there's no in inner experience of uh, being a conscious experiencing being. Anyway, so um, why did we get into this tangle? Okay. Um, we were studying this Vayu Sarvatrago Mahan. We three Akasha, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I must be getting old. So this is mind space. Even this is not the uh, end. Vedanta says. But all of these activities of the mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, we have got, done these analysis again and again. It appears to consciousness, in consciousness. Consciousness and mind are not the same thing. So consciousness is again conceived of as another space. Chidakasha. What is that space? Yeah, it is just Brahman. It's just Atman. That Atman, Brahman itself is called Chidakasha. So in Chidakasha, which is the space of consciousness or consciousness that is space. Oh, this, sorry, the other way around. Space that is consciousness. In that space that is consciousness, chitta akasha, mind appears. And in the mind uh, space, the maha akasha appears. So Vedanta has an inside out view. We think that this physical universe is vast. It is. The mind is vaster. It is an appearance in the mind. And consciousness is vaster still. And you are that vast consciousness. So Akasha example, very profound. See, Akasha space is the closest that we have got. The best example of Brahman is the closest. Why closest? Because in the Upanishads, uh, they say that is the first evolute from consciousness. The first appearance of a material universe from consciousness is space. So that is the closest that you get in a material universe to Atman or Brahman. It's not Atman or Brahman. It's still an objective thing. It's still um, dead space out there, but it's still um, the closest that you get. 
Taittiri Upanishad says, Tasmadva etasmad, et, tasmadva etasmad atmana akasha sambhuta akasha vayo vayo ragner agner apa adhya prithivihi. Um, and then prithivya mosha the and all that. From this very atman, I'm translating, from this atman, which atman? Is referring to an earlier uh, statement where he's defining Brahman. Satyam jnanam anantam brahma. Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. Brahman is infinite existence consciousness. And that Brahman is calling the Atman. <laughs> that Brahman, which is this Atman, Atman means you. From this Atman, evolved space. Um, evolved means it appeared as space. Consciousness appeared as space. How? Why? Maya. Is it at all possible for consciousness to appear as space? Well, your mind can do it. In, in um, dreams, don't you have a whole dream world which is projected? Isn't there a space there? Yes, there is. That's where all the, all the drama of your dream takes, takes place. And nowadays, it is easier to conceive of all of this because of virtual reality, you know. We can, through computers and all, we can design lots of spaces which exist only in a, in a, in a computer. I'm not physically in the computer, just in the program. So virtual spaces. Similarly, consciousness projects space first. And then it goes on to say space evolves into, um, in, into air, fire, water, earth in progressive orders of concreteness and grossness from subtle to gross this is the ancient cosmology most ancient um, civilizations had something like this earth earth water fire space like that so space is the closest to the atman the first evolute and that's why it's often used as examples it is used as a meditative technique for enlightenment so in kashmiri shaivism for example this is a favorite way of, uh, um, of trying to trick the mind into enlightenment. I'll give you a couple of examples. I think they are there in Vijnana Bhairava. One th definitely is there in Vijnana Bhairava. The well-known well example of the vast blue sky. Imagine, not imagine, actually you're supposed to see it. Uh, if you have, uh, like today we had, vast blue skies here brilliant day a cool but brilliant day here in manhattan so if you look up cloudless endless blue sky uh, in the morning or afternoon evening now what you're supposed to do is you go out there in the park and sit on the bench and get a clear view of the uh, sky and then look up into the sky it works even better if you go to out there to sheep meadow and lie down on the grass so that you're looking up and there's only the sky above you and nothing else. Just the sky. And look up intensely. This is a meditation done with open eyes. Look up intensely. Till you are so absorbed and focused in the fastness, blueness and radiance. It's not just a sky. It's a radiant sky. It's, it's, it's luminous with, with the, you know, the early winter sunlight. So you look into that. And... With such intensity, you, you should come to the, almost like a feeling of falling into the sky as if uh, it, it were, you know, to that intensity. And then what you're supposed to do is, as you're absorbed and looking and looking at that, close your eyes, shut it, close your eyes in a moment and mentally also drop that blue sky. Drop that blue sky. And in that moment, it, it's a, like a fast thing that's done. In that moment, what should be left is the radiance without the sky. And that radiance, it's just like an after image or something. The radiance without the sky, it should trick the mind. It's like a trap door opening in the mind. Point the mind back towards the radiance, which is its own source, which is the Shiva nature. In Kashmiri Shaivism, the nature of ultimate reality is called Shiva. And what is it? It is Prakasha Vimarsha, light, which is self-aware. Vimarsha means it is aware of itself. 
to the closest you can get is the luminous sky. Empty all your thoughts, feelings, perception, story, time, um, body sense, what day it is, what time it is, what you have to do next. Nothing you have to do now. This is the end of the world. This is it. There's nothing more after this. Life comes to an end here. The world comes to an end here. There is nothing left after this. Just that vast blue sky. And then drop that vast blue sky. The vastness, blueness, all is dropped into just the glowing after image of that radiance. And the radiance also is a material radiance. But it points back to Prakasha Vimarsha, the self-aware luminosity, which you are. It should work. And the beauty of it is, if it, even if it doesn't work, wait a few minutes, take a few deep breaths and go back to it again. The vast blue sky is still there. So it's a very good way of emptying the mind. Relax, empty, put in effort, intense focus, and then drop it. Um, a psychologist and philosopher who had done um, research on focus, concentration, he says, forget the name, he says, um, call in something, he says that all the major breakthroughs in science, in art, and of course in spiritual life, have been made by concentration, but not during that concentration. It is that intense concentration, you must work at it. That day, that particular session, and your daily meditation, and for months, maybe years, work at it, whatever you're focusing on. And then, once that intense focus is over, that session is over, a little after that, the breakthrough may come. That's why in our meditation, our meditation masters always tell us after the end of the meditation, so we have to offer the fruits of meditation, there's some practices to be done. Then don't jump up from your Colin McCormick. Exact. Uh, is this Colin McCormick? Just a minute. Um, let me see. Might be. Let me just see. He was a very troubled man, this person. Um, no, this is not PhD student. This is not this person. Uh, I'll tell you. He wrote a number of books. He became pretty famous. He was an Englishman. Um, I'll try to remember. Anyway, but this is not, uh, doesn't depend on the particular uh, researcher or, or the particular thinker. Uh, it is uh, something that's well known. Uh, I mean, those who study the psychology of my of attention, they know this. We also know this. So we are told by our meditation masters, don't jump up from your seat and um, you know, make a run for it. Done for today. Enough meditation. And Because you know, young brahmacharis, novices, meditation is boring. How, but you're forced by the strict monks. You have to stick to your morning meditation and evening meditation. We are actually not allowed to get up before you complete the basic minimum. So... It's over, done, I've done it, and now run away. No, don't do that. Stay there. Just sit quietly for a few minutes. That's a very, very, very valuable time. Especially if you put in the effort before that. I know of people of they've actually attained enlightenment. Intense spiritual practice. I know, monks in the Himalayas. And um, they had a very good time of it, very good spiritual practice, meditation, living on arms, wandering in the Himalayas. And then, not that they had any particular breakthrough, some good meditation sessions, some not so good. And finally, coming back after that, maybe few months of practice. And that moment of relaxation, breakthrough comes. At that point, they were not trying. They were not in a cave and meditating. That was done maybe a few days ago. And the breakthrough comes. A real deep breakthrough, which is, lasts lifelong after that. But it did not come during the actual practice itself. It came after that. So anyway, my point is, when you let go 
and uh, relax. At that point, it may come. And the beauty of this, um, this is, these are called dharanas, techniques in Kashmiri Shaiva meditation. They are found in a book called Vijnana Bhairav, which has 112 such techniques. Um, so, um, uh, the beauty of this is, you can repeat it. Because it's done in an instant. So, you build up that focus, that intensity again, and then let it go in an instant. And stay with it. Doesn't work, doesn't matter. Take a breath, relax, and cycle it back again. Anyway, so this is uh, how Akasha space is used. Another one which I heard from a sadhu, I think it is there in Vijnana Bhairava, but I'm not very sure. But it, it was sounded so funny that I remembered it. It's like you visualize a well, like you might find in a village in India, a stone well, you know. And uh, they are pretty deep. And if you look in them, it's dark. So imagine, it's just imagine. You don't actually do it in a real well. You imagine sitting quietly. And you're looking into this well. So it cuts off all your vision of everything else. And you're looking down into space. You're looking down into space. You'll get, if you look, if you imagine it powerfully enough, you'll get a sort of almost vertigo-like feeling that you're falling down into space. And there, the next thing that you have to do is, let go of the walls. In one, like a jerk, let go of the walls in your imagination. The walls of the well. So like it becomes space without limit into which you are falling. It should also work. And there are many such techniques there. And remember in these techniques, they are technique. They are not... Um, spiritual philosophy, not tattva, as they say. They, they are not truths. They are not like Brahman is real, the world is false, you are Brahman. They are not of that level, not, not, not like what Krishna says. These are just tricks. They are meant to trick you. So don't take the blue sky, very important, make it very important, and start worshipping the blue sky, make a philosophy of the vast blue sky, or a well, even worse. Those are just techniques to um, sort of trick the mind. Yes. Why did I say all this? It's just because uh, the sky, how important the sky is, and what a beautiful example it is, and how it can be used for um, meditation practice. Next, number seven. Sarva bhutani kaunteya prakritim yanti mamikam kalpakshaye punastani at the end of a cycle, all beings, O son of Kunti, attain my Prakriti. At the beginning of the next cycle, I again send them forth. So, why did this happen? Remember, why did this verse come along? He is explaining how Brahman is Jagat Karana, as Saguna Brahman, same pure consciousness, Nirguna Brahman, as Saguna Brahman, is the cause of this manifestation. Why at all is this manifestation there? Because Nirguna Brahman is also Saguna Brahman with the power of Maya. It's like the mind is um, has got it's saturated with impressions collected in the waking state and it produces dreams when we fall asleep. So the same mind, uh, every night when you fall asleep, it will send forth the impressions in the form of dream experiences. When you wake up, those impressions come back into the mind and stay in a potential state. They will again produce dreams when you go, go into sleep. Similarly here, um, Saguna Brahman withdraws this Maya with the impressions of this world into Maya. It is just Brahman and nothing else. And then again it projects, Maya projects these varieties of appearances in Saguna Brahman and that we call creation, Srishti. So he says, Kalpadu, uh, uh, at the beginning of, of creation. Um, so the Hindus have this idea of a cycle of existence, uh, projection, existence, and dissolution of the universe over vast eons of time, millions and billions of years. I mentioned earlier once that Carl Sagan, who did that Cosmos series, I think now um, the Cosmos series is being repeated or has been repeated 
by that uh, astronomer who is here in the um, museum, the metropole, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yes. So Neil deGrasse Tyson has repeated the Cosmos series, but when we were kids, Carl Sagan, uh, Carl Sagan uh, he uh, produced this, he wrote the book Cosmos and he produced this uh, series. As kids, we used to watch it on television, very beautifully done. I guess kids today would laugh at the special effects in those series, but it was for us, it was awesome. And there uh, in the book, he mentions that it's modern science and cosmology, which has vastly expanded our horizons. We now think in terms of vast spaces um, of light years. Light years, by the way, it's not a unit of time. It's the amount of distance traveled by light in, in a year. So vast, unthinkably vast spaces, distances, and unthinkably vast long uh, durations of time. Earlier theologians thought of the universe or the world as thousands of years old. Now that's laughably small. We think of the universe as millions of years, billions of years old. So our modern science has really expanded our idea of time and space of this universe, the real sheer scale and magnitude of this universe. And then Carl Sagan says, the only other civilization which had uh, an even more awesome sense of time and space is, uh, is the ancient Hindu civilization. And they thought in terms of, um, you know, cosmic cycles of universes being created, existing, and then passing away and new universes being created. Only thing is, from an Advaitic perspective, this creation, existence, and passing of the universes, they are all like dreams. And the dreaming mind is like Brahman. Brahman is the one reality which, which projects all this. How? Through Maya. He says here, Prakriti. He calls it Prakriti, but it's Maya, the power of Maya. Then what is the relationship between Maya and Brahman? Strictly from an Advaitic perspective, no relationship. Brahman alone exists. However, Sister Nivedita once said to Vivekananda, can I say that Kali is the dream of Shiva? And Vivekananda considered it for a moment and then he laughed and he said, well, 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 have it your way. So Maya is the dream of Brahman, maybe? And that's a new way of putting it. So all beings, all of us, this in sentient beings, the external universe, all of this is a projection because of Maya. And Maya is, the ground of Maya is Brahman. And then what happens? The universe plays out, life and death and struggle and happiness, misery, worlds begin, worlds end, evolution takes place, um, better and better bodies are evolved. And the sentient beings now get these vehicles, you know, human bodies, God bodies and whatnot. And progress spiritually, some attain enlightenment, some don't. And the universe is now withdrawn by, by Brahman into its, into its Maya. Kalpakshay. Uh, Kalpakshay, what a language, you know. We, we translate it as, uh, as the um, end, at the end of a cycle. But Kalpakshaya is the, in the decay of, of the eons, you know, the, the, the sheer poetry of the word. Like, like time itself decays into nothingness. And the world ends, the universe ends. I pull them all back into Maya. One sadhu in Uttarakhand, I remember in Haridwar, he said, we are playing hide and seek with God. Right now, we are all looking for God and God is hiding. And we are trying to find God. Where is God? Where is God? We are like little children trying to find out. And the granny is hiding. And at the end of the universe, we all disappear back into the Maya of, of Ishwara, of, of Saguna Brahman. And then Brahman alone remains. Now the Brahman now begins to search for us. Where did those fellows go? Where are they hiding? And then he finds us and then he projects us back into this world again, creates this universe and hides himself. And so this hide and seek goes on. <laughs> just, he was just putting it in a funny way. So right now, God is hiding and we are seeking for God. All right, let's uh, wrap it up here. Actually, I should 
read the eighth one also together with this. The two go together, seven and eight. Prakritim swam avashtabhya visri jami puna puna bhuta gramam imam kritsnam avasham prakritir vashat. Presiding over my nature, Prakriti, I again and again sent forth this entire aggregate of helpless beings according to their nature. So, how does the Lord create this universe and maintain it and dissolve it back with Maya, with Prakriti? Is it random? No, it's not random. It depends on our, on our past karma. Where we are on the spiritual on the scale of evolution, depending on that, will be given new experiences in this universe and in each life that we have in this universe until we attain to enlightenment. So that's the grand story. Advaita Vedanta has a slightly different take on it. All of this is a story. <laughs> that's the that stresses on the story. The reality is that you are Brahman always. It was fine. Um, so we go through this according to our karma, depending on where we were in the last universe. So we are all withdrawn into the bosom of the Divine Mother, into Prakriti, into Maya. Sri Ramakrishna puts it this way. After harvest, the granny of the house, she goes out into the fields and collects seeds and puts them in little pieces of cloth and she ties it up. And she knows each little bundle has a seed of this plant and that vegetable and this and that. And she keeps it. And when time comes for planting it in the next season, she takes it out and she, uh, she plants them. And those same plants, vegetables, crops, they come up. So like that, so who's granny? Mahamaya. And who, who, what are those seeds? We, we, we are sentient beings. Um, so we are gathered together by the Divine Mother. And when the time comes for new experiences, we are again sent forth into this universe. So how is it done? Through Maya. Brahman does it through Maya. What is the logic behind it? Our karma, not random. We are not being punished or you know, arbitrarily, cruelly treated. No, actually we are being given a wonderful opportunity to grow and evolve spiritually through dramatic life experiences and uh, often sometimes very painful, sometimes shocking and terrifying. You might say that's a very, very terrible way of learning. But notice that uh, one thing is constant. Nothing, even the worst of things, death, disaster, tragedy, tragedies, nothing destroys us. If it's at all true that we have gone through multiple lifetimes, then we are here. One sadhu in Uttarakhand, in a group of devotees were there, he's, he would say, Aap ho na, you are here, isn't it? Forget past lives. You have no memory of that. This life, after having seen so much in your life, from babyhood to childhood, some of us had tragic lives. Some had protected and privileged lives. Whatever it is, even the worst of life somebody has had, not denying it was terrible, but notice one uh, fact. You are here to listen to this. So Yeah, that's because I'm alive, I might say. I'll die, then what will happen? Well, you'll still be there. That particular body and life is gone. That's what Vedanta is trying to say. Not just Vedanta. That's what every religion is trying to say. The theology is different. The mechanics are different. The fact is, we are immortal beings. We don't die. We are not destroyed. And that gives us a clue to what we are, who we are. And children of God, children of immortal bliss. None other than God. One with God, Brahman. The, the sheer indestructible nature of, of you. Uh -huh. Bhuta gramam imam. So grama here does not mean, you know, in, for Indians immediately they think of a village. But the Sanskrit word grama simply means collection. This entire catalog, collection of uh, sentient beings projected forth again and again into multiple creations, multiple universes. Okay. Let me now take a look at the comments.
Shachi Sharma says, can I ask a verse of chapter 4, verse 24, Brahmaharpanam? I read in Shankaracharya's commentary that the verse is referring to Jnana Yagya, so knowledge is sacrificed. Knowledge is not sacrificed. It's a sacrifice of knowledge. Yeah, so, so knowledge is generated in that. So sacrifice means you give up everything else, you focus on Vedanta, Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana, and you repeat this. So this is the Jnana Yagya going on. What is a sacrifice? Where the, the material sacrifice is where a fire is lit and the priests are there and um, you commission a sacrifice to be, uh, to be performed. Um, you know, butter or something, milk or, or curds, they are poured into the fire. So this is, you are giving, this is the sacrifice. Here, what is being sacrificed? Uh, it is uh, your effort, your attention. It's Sacrificed means it's being poured into Vedanta. This is the uh, knowledge sacrifice. Knowledge is not being sacrificed. So this is... Uh... Sri Ram says, Swamiji is the practical way to get to a third level recommended by Bhagavan Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi. Koham, yes. While repeating a mantra, when does the mantra sound originate? Are these most direct paths? Yes. Repeating a mantra, tracing back the mantra sound. But what Ramana Maharshi recommends is not a dharana, not one of the Vigyana Bhairava technique. It is a direct pointing to the, to the reality. If that doesn't work, if still one doesn't get what's going on there, then these techniques are the next level. In fact, a great Kashmiri Shaiva saint and philosopher, I think it was Abhinava Gupta, who says these techniques, dharanas, multiple techniques of meditation to, to help you to attain realization, for the uh, one who knows, they are, none of them are necessary. The one who realizes I am the Atman. They cannot reveal the Atman to you. They cannot reveal your Shiva nature to you. They can only trick your mind and hope for the best. To expect these, this is the, the direct translation of the verse, to expect these techniques to reveal Shiva to you is like expecting a pot to illumine the sun. <laughs> a pot Cannot illumine the sun. So that, that's I'm explaining now. That, that's as much as Abhinav Gupta said. Pot cannot illumine the sun. A pot cannot illumine itself. A pot cannot illumine anything else. Moreover, the pot is illumined by the sun. See, the beauty of these masters is just by giving this example, expecting a pot to illumine the sun, here also he has given a doorway to enlightenment. See, those who, those who know, those who see, they will immediately see the secret of this verse. What he, he is again showing you a direct path to reality. The pot, what is the pot like? Mind. Meditation technique in the mind. The meditative mind is the pot. Then what is the sun? You are the sun. You are illumining that calm and concentrated mind. Calm and concentrated mind cannot reveal you. You are revealing it all the time. And that moment you will be free when you get this. Know yourself to be the sun. Know the instrument of all knowledge to be like a pot. What is the instrument of all knowledge? Mind. It's mind which knows everything. And yet it's like a pot compared to you, the Atman. It is illumined by you. That immediately shows you what you are and it sets you free from the mind. You can say now, the, let the pot-like mind remain as it is. I don't care. What it thinks, what it understands, what it does not understand, what it believes, what it does not believe, it's all child's play. I have realized the vast. I am that. Who is or qualifies to be Saguna Brahman? No, nobody qualifies to be Saguna. Saguna Brahman means God. It is pure consciousness with the power of Maya, limited by Maya. So the, all of these terms uh, can be easily clarified. If one goes through a one course, uh, I would say Vedanta Sara is good. It's available. The text is available. All the classes are available. So all the definitions you will know. What is God in Vedanta? What is the self in Vedanta? Uh, what do you mean by meditation? What do you mean by inquiry? What is this world? What is Maya? 
What is ignorance? What is meant by enlightenment? All of these questions are precisely answered. So this is an introductory book to uh, Vedanta. Do that. Uh, Vedanta Sar is good. This Abhijit says in the sky meditation technique we described when one drops it, how to not involve agency, one's will or sankalpa. The point to drop the effort of meditation itself. No, not so advanced. It's a sankalpa. It's a decision taken by the mind itself. Drop. The effect is not done voluntarily because if you do it voluntarily, then again the mind is working. The effect should be a dropping away of the mind. Mm. You are dropping Mahakasha from your mind and hopefully the mind will cling. Chitta Akasha will cling to Mahakasha and will be flushed out along with that, leaving only Chitta Akasha. Hopefully. Rick says, many astronauts have had uh, life-transforming spiritual awakenings while out in space, such as Edgar Mitchell. Yeah, they have refer- Some of them are really spiritual experiences. They have referred to it. What's his name? Our Captain Kirk, um, William Shatner. He also had a transformative experience, but it was, he was miserable more or less when he went to space this time. But he went for just a few minutes. Rodrigo, Prithivi Matapul, gravitation is difficult to overcome. Yes. Alpana says, is this whole world like machine learning program? Well, it's one way of looking at this world. It's like a gymnasium where we learn and grow, uh, Vivekananda says. One way. Amit says, what would be a recommended book to read the Gita versus with good explanation for self-reading? One would be Bhagavad Gita with you know, the explanations by Swami Tapasyanandaji. I wonder if I've got it here. Another would be um, Swami Ranganathanandaji's three-volume Bhagavad Gita, which is every verse with extensive general explanations. The book which we used, which was recommended at Harvard University, I can show it to you. I have my copy here. Different good books are there, which are used in universities. So um, during my time there, Professor Clooney recommended the Bhagavad Gita New Translation by Feuerstein. Feuerstein. Bhagavad Gita New Translation. George Feuerstein. Feuerstein is well known for his books on yoga, Patanjali Yoga. It's a good translation. Priya says, technical problem saying Maya is a dream of Brahman brings duality to non-dual Brahman. Sounds more devotional. That's why Swamiji did not object. Yes. I mean, it's a sort of poetic way of expressing it. Brahman doesn't dream. Then Samadhi says, often consciously we try to remember the step one. God is in all beings. We elevate it. How do we think of certain specific people who aren't good to us? We tend to think poorly of them. And then descend into a cycle of negative emotions. Yes. So you can think of the people who are not good, who are behaving badly with you. You know that they are not good people. How can God dwell there? Think of them as a ruined temple. But God is there. Deity is still there. The temple is in disrepair. So it needs a paint job and a little bit of renovation and things like that. Kalpana says, how are space and air at different degrees of reality? They are not. They are not. Uh, so space and air are the same degrees of reality. Material space and material air. right? And yet, the amazing thing is air, heat, radiation, nothing aff- uh, affects space, sky, in general. Relativistic physics aside. Maharaj, microphone. Oh, it's far away. Took it off, yes. 
right? So the different levels of reality we are introducing in order to make sense. And of course, it's not entirely innovation on our side when Krishna said, they are not in me. What's the magic of my power or, or maya? And that is the multiple levels of reality. They are appearances in me. Siddharth says, is the pot the mind or the vessel of the mind? You mean the pot and the sun example? The pot is the mind and uh, the sun is the Atman, you. The real you is the sun. See, normally we think of ourselves as the mind. It's just a thing. Mind is just a thing like a pot. And it's lit up, revealed by the sunlight. Similarly, mind is just a thing. It's lit up by you, consciousness. And borrowing your consciousness, the mind becomes an instrument of knowledge. It gives you the experiences through the eyes of seeing, through the ears of hearing and so on. And through itself, the mind can think, remember, desire, imagine, um, uh, fear, uh, all of that, suffer. But you, the light, you are neither imagining, desiring, fearing, um, hating, suffering. No, you are making all of that possible. This subtle difference one must understand. Okay. Gravitational waves rip space apart. As Abhijit said, yes, it should uh, do that because if it is material, then it should be affected like everything material. There must be something very profound which can affect uh, space also. It just goes to show space also is material. In fact, there was a nice question somebody asked. Why should we not consider that space itself is God? Why? Because God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. So space is um, omnipresent. It's everywhere. Obviously, everything else uh, has to be in space. He's talking about material space, just this space, the universe. Everything in the universe is in space, so space is omnipresent. Then um, omnipotent. According to the Upanishad, which you just quoted, space evolved into air, fire, water, earth. So it is the creator of the entire universe. Omniscient, all-knowing. So, ah, but how can space be all-knowing? Well, it is space which has evolved into all-knowing beings. All of us and uh, your uh, artificial intelligence, robots, aliens, if they exist in space, all are evolutes of space. Space into, uh, into um, air, into fire, into water, into earth and all combinations. Are in this space. So space is omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. So why not? Um, it fulfills the definition of Brahman. So isn't space Brahman? No. Space is still objective. It is you are aware of space. Space is not aware of you. Space cannot think. Just as we saw, you can say space evolved into these bodies. That is true. But did space evolve into thought? No, it, the thought is not in this physical space. Anyway, so this, that was an interesting question. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu